Hi, good evening. I'm Michelle White. I'm senior curator at the Manila and I'm really pleased to have you here with us for tonight's talk. I'll soon be joined by the renowned American artist, Ronnie Horn. Okay, before we start, I'd love to just to share a few technical, practical notes uh, with you about this webinar format. Uh, you may experience some technical difficulties. We hope not, but if you do, you can send questions in the chat box. Um, and we are recommending for this format that in your viewing, you change it to side-by-side -side gallery view. Um, and that will ensure that you can see our presentation slides as well as uh, Ronnie and myself. Okay, but most importantly, we really want your questions and to engage with you, our audience. So please send in questions to the Q&A box. It's currently at the bottom of my screen. I will be monitoring it throughout the evening. Um, and uh, please send them in. We'll also uh, be taking uh, questions uh, at the end of the talk. So first I'd love to introduce Ronnie Horn. Ronnie is, has been the subject of so many major exhibitions worldwide, uh, including Ronnie Horn recently at the Foundation Beiler in Basel to the major traveling retrospective Ronnie Horn, AKA Ronnie Horn, which was organized by the Tate Modern in London and then traveled to the Whitney Museum of American Art and the ICA in Boston in 2009, 2010. Ronnie received her MFA from Yale University. She studied as an undergrad at the Rhode Island School of Design. Her work is held in collections worldwide. She currently lives and works in New York and has certainly spent considerable time and formative time uh, in Iceland. Okay, so Ronnie is also no stranger to the Manil, even though uh, she is uh, far away from us today. Um, and you may uh, remember Ronnie's work. Ronnie and I worked together uh, at the Manil Drawing Institute in 2019 on a two-part exhibition called when I breathe, I draw. And it looked comprehensively at Ronnie's uh, production and ways of thinking through the medium of drawing. And this was an important show too, because it brought together her major large scale drawings. Uh, the artist was also the inaugural artist um, when uh, the muse when the Drawing Institute opened in 2018, she came and installed this incredible work called Wits in Sampler uh, in the main space of the Manila Drawing Institute. It consists of hundreds and hundreds of idioms silk screened on the wall. Uh, and it was just really kind of some really fun experiences uh, with the artist here in Houston, uh, talking about the work, thinking about the work, which is really how Goldfield happened. Uh, uh, we are so grateful for the artist's generosity in allowing us to exhibit this work, Goldfield from 1980 to 1982. And this is a work that's currently on view in our modern and contemporary galleries. And <clears throat> it's really what I was hoping uh, the artist and I could focus on tonight. Um, what you'll see here is the work and I'll say like all of Horn's works, uh, seeing them in reproduction really does, does it no justice. And what defines this work, which is so extraordinary, is what it's made of. It's pure 24 karat gold. It's a mat of pure gold. It lays on the floor. And uh, the way we've installed it for this particular iteration, there's a, a crease on the top and what happens is that in that crease, uh, it captures and radiates the most extraordinary deep orange light. Um, and with that, I'd love to welcome Ronnie Horn uh, to join the conversation. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Michelle. It's, it's nice to see you. We got to talk for like 10 minutes before this started and- Yep. 
I, I had to tell you to, to, we had to stop because we were kind of getting into the conversation too soon. Yeah. Well, how's, how's, how's life been these past few months for you? Kind of the same as it always is. Uh, I don't have anything really extraordinary to report. Uh, I, I'm a very solitary person by nature and the pandemic suited me fine personally. Uh, it's, uh, I think that when you go from a voluntary solitude to involuntary solitude, it's definitely a different psychology, but I got over it. And you're going back and forth between the city and, and your place in upstate. Somewhat, not much. I, I'm up here for about a month again now, but, uh, I was up here most of the pandemic so far yeah well it's great to see you i miss you we had such fun here in houston yes absolutely absolutely and, and thank you for letting us exhibit this incredible work and that's really where i just want to jump in talking about because as you know we installed it just a, a few months ago in the galleries and uh over the past few months i've been kind of jumping into the galleries every so often and watching people interact with the work. And I have to say like the best part of this kind of delight of kind of people realizing that they're seeing this piece, what it's made of, and then essentially discovering how the light operates uh, with, with and through this material almost. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna show this, image, Ronnie, because this I first saw this work when it was installed in Venice, uh, I guess, was this 2015? Um, and I saw it with Venetian light. So what could be like more romantic than that? Uh, right. How the light off the canal came into this space was absolutely remarkable. Yeah, and the other detail, I don't know whether you noticed it, but at the top of the image, you'll see some of uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres' portrait, which is across the beams at the top. Oh my gosh, I didn't. Yeah, it's a little subtle, I have to say. They, I think they used the kind of gray color for the text and it's, it's very quiet, but yeah. Well, and, and that I think is like where I kind of like, I had my discovery with this light. And, and my first question for you is when you started thinking about this piece, how you, you basically discovered how, how light worked with gold. Yeah, Michelle, that's kind of a funny story because I had, I really, <clears throat> I started out as I always do fairly conceptually. And of course, uh, being, as I've said so often, a, the daughter of a pawnbroker's uh, uh, father, uh, I kind of had some experience with gold uh, from a very young age in the form of, mainly in the form of jewelry. And uh, trying to reconcile the experience I had uh, with all of the mythology around gold was not, it just was not happening. So on the one hand, you had this kind of, in my mind, kind of boring yellow metal. And then you have these metaphors, uh, which have for, for uh, hundreds of years associated gold with the sun, with, uh, with immortality, with perfection, uh, with uh, so many things that are kind of absolute uh, that I, I didn't, didn't understand that, you know, and I carried that with me. Uh, and eventually I, I had, uh, when I left uh, graduate school, I uh, was reading a lot of philosophy for, for uh, a few years there. And one of the writers uh, was Martin Heidegger, who talked a lot about uh, actually uh, wanting a closer relationship. Uh, actually, this is Thoreau, wanting a closer relationship to the sun. 
And I think that this gold field was, was kind of a search for that. And when I figured out how to do this with some engineers, and what I mean by do this is to produce a gold that is, it's not a carrot gold, it's a highly, highly refined gold. They say it's 9.5 or 9.4 pure, which it has to be because I've taken this material and I've welded it to itself. So there's no, there's no second material holding it together. It's just what it is. It's a surface. A very, very thin piece of metal, uh, maybe a third the thickness of your hair. Uh, let's say my hair, which is a little thicker, but. And the point of that saying that is that I wanted to attenuate the gold to make it all visible in a sense. You know, uh, gold is very malleable and it's very strong. So you can, in effect, spread it out very thin and still have object integrity. Uh -huh. So that's how I conceive this, that it would be uh, a material, uh, an object that would give back to gold its corp corporeal reality that had been uh, taken away from it in the history of ornamentation and jewelry and decorative arts, uh, where it either is placing gold, making gold dependent on a subsurface or it's it's alloying the material uh, with other metals, which make it less of what it is in itself. So really very few people know what gold really is and what it can do. So this is a piece in a way, a little bit about giving back to the material, it, it's natural reality, you know? So you have in this piece, for example, this extraordinary splendor, the uh, interaction with the light and I always like to show this in daylight mm -hmm. uh, if, because I don't want any illusion that it's anything other than the gold. And even in the quietest daylight, you will have this uh, glow of light because it's so reflective. And uh, the color is, is just, uh, I, this is when I discovered the uh, splendor of gold. When I was in the studio and I started to fold the thing uh -huh. and there it was. So you asked me about the light, that's the, that's the first time I saw it and I was, uh, it made a big impression. So uh, that, that uh, it, it, very simple. Well, I mean, and that's like all your work, there's a sort of simplicity, but then when you start to sort of kind of dive deeper into how you're essentially dealing or let's say not dealing with ideas of metaphor or the symbolic, right? With the, with the material like, gold which is so like symbolically dense to kind of almost kind of flirt with its uh its weight here because in a way it's just there it's just gold and I as I'm again like I'm in, I'm thinking through this work through um kind of visitors and walking people through Ronnie which is just incredibly illuminating and I have to say like uh, there's a lot of uh, visitors who like to like immediately quantify. So they see it and they see it only as gold. And then they're, they're sort of calculating what it's worth. And yeah. I think like as an artist, that first might seem like horrible, but then it, 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 it does its job of existing as a substance, not as a representation of something. Well, it's definitely connecting to an idea of value that, you know, um, things don't have inherent value you know they, they this it, as much as gold is associated with value that's been something that's been culturally bestowed on it uh, very much like diamonds because uh uh these things uh gather value through desire you know uh but gold um the when you when you handle this material this pure material it's like a solid it's it's like a thick water a thick water and it just it's very sensual it's very physical and you would never know that from the way gold has been absorbed into the culture of objects and things you know uh, whether it's the gold leaf form you know 
or as I mentioned, the jewelry, it, because it really kind of robs it of its uniqueness. Right. And, and it, what's incredible is how it holds. So, you know, as we were installing it, watching the installers kind of like pull that curve over, which you think it would just sort of collapse on itself, but it just has this kind of extraordinary ability to hold, hold the, the weight of it. Um, and I'm actually wondering, I'm going to sort of jump ahead to, to this image, um, because can you talk a little bit, I mean, when we talked about installing this, we talked about the curve, but can you talk about how you've shown it um, sort of differently in the past, like, like the iteration we see here? When yeah, was this is, a, you know, when I was discovering the piece in my studio. So this is a shot from the studio. And I just was playing with the gold. And the more I played with it, the more, you know, the splendor, the relationship to the light really kind of uh, wowed me. Uh, so this is just a simple fold over and it's definitely an, uh, one way to, to uh, show it. Uh, I wound up settling on the way the Manil has it installed because it, keeps it as what it is in the most simple form, just this mat that lies there on the ground with the dust. And yet it is this very much this other thing, which is the opposite of dust, the extreme opposite of dust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's like brings up, I think a really important part of this is how it sits directly on the for, and not to state the obvious, but like how, what a key part of this work is that it lies flat and can have a sense of the, the, the thinness of the material, but it also yeah. sort of pulls it away from that hierarchical relationship that you're referring to. Yeah, I mean, I think once you start, I mean, <clears throat> the problem with gold is it does have value. And for those of you who are curious, when I did this piece, it went for $311 a troy ounce, which gold is measured in troy ounces. It's a slightly heavier than a, a normal ounce. So yeah, I, I, uh, I think gold now goes around 1800 uh, an ounce. Uh, and somehow that was never relevant to me other than when I had to find the money to produce the work, which was at that time, it was basically cost me uh, my salary for a year. Oh my gosh. So that, you know, that it was not an easy work to uh, finance it and, and get it to happen. You know, the technology behind it and everything is quite old, but it's not really used. So it was a lot of, um, I was lucky enough to meet an incredible engineer a Scottish engineer that worked at a gold, a precious metals factory or refinery really. And we would have these long conversations about how to make gold totally visible, how to work it out so I could simply have a surface of gold, which was also an object, you know, mm -hmm. and self-evident as what it was. So that, that was, and that's how I do a lot of my work. I, I meet, people who actually do things. I don't really do much. I just think about things and what I want to do. It's a big difference between your dreams and your and the reality you can you can actually uh, uh, manifest. It's it's usually a big leap, mm -hmm. you know, between those two things. But with the gold field, I felt I had come pretty close to my dream or my my imagination for what I wanted. And, and what's interesting too, Ronnie, I was looking at your uh, exhibition catalog uh, in Munich from 1983 um, and sort of to think about the pieces that came right before, right? So you're also, and I'm thinking specifically of like the soft metal pieces, the wood pieces, the, the rubber pieces that were directly on the floor and how you were kind of thinking through different materials and their relationship and how they work on the floor. I mean, do you see this piece kind of coming out of those? Well, I don't, but I see why you would or anybody outside 
because I feel like for me, this was really more of a conceptual piece. Uh -huh. uh, and the works you're talking about were much more uh, formal. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. All of it, you know, but all of that work is so, so, it's so much dependent on the actual. Like the gold piece, if nothing else, it's so dependent on the actual. So in a way, it's the antithesis of virtual reality. Right. And this is actually, we have a question that has just come in that's related to this. And this anonymous attendee here is wondering about display. Um, and I think this relates to it. Like, okay, we see an antique kind of old building in Venice here. And then, of course, in Houston, we have a more traditional. Uh, white cube. Um, how do you understand the the work and how it changes within the different settings that it's been displayed in? Interesting question. I would say honestly that the showing of the field in a distilled minimalist space is for me the least interesting. And I've always enjoyed showing in Europe because I'm often given opportunities to show in spaces that have a lot of historical character. I mean, if you look at the work I installed many years ago down in Marfa in this really kind of bombed out looking shed that wound up becoming a permanent installation, I actually think that, that the setting get, plays off of the the uh, the uh, the sculpture itself in a very positive way, and I think that Venetian installation we were just looking at has the same uh, interaction. Uh, when you get too reduced to space, it's kind of redundant on the work itself. There's not enough dialectic going on. Mm -hmm. And I again, and then at the middle, of course, it is a white cube, but we have natural light, but shift throughout the day it's a real luxury these days to have that right you know? and it there is this kind of the light pulls it through and animates the work i was just down there today and it's kind of a dark rainy day here and it yeah. looks spectacular with low light um, yeah, yeah yeah exactly you know it's very it's very it functions very much like a landscape uh, because of its interaction with the light. Like, for example, when you go to Paris and you see all that lime, limestone facades and everything, I think of Paris as a landscape, not an urban scape, because of the complexity of the interaction with the stone mm -hmm. and the generosity of that interaction in terms of uh, my experience with it. So, and, you know, the gold field, the glass pieces certainly all partake of light and transparency or self-evidence uh it's very very important uh to the experience mm -hmm. and like let's 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 roll with this idea of the landscape because what i i also have kind of come to, come to love about this work is i know you have often talked about your work as kind of how do you kind of strip metaphor right how do you kind of remove the, the the metaphorical from the work and in this piece it's almost like grapples with it like it's so a statement of its materiality but at the same time there's this flirtation with the landscape just by the sort of simple gesture of a plane on a horizontal surface yeah, that's all that's all true. But what I found when you try to strip metaphor away that the audience will bring it in because it's a way of relating to things mm -hmm. and the gold. There is so much historical uh, and really individual uh, experience with it. You know, it, it has so much political, social, cultural meaning that you can't come to gold without an idea of gold, not necessarily what's in front of you, but whatever, whatever your experience has been. Yeah. So this is, you know, this was more like, uh, sort of for me, confrontational, mm -hmm. uh, flying in the face of inherent value, flying in the face of, um, the, the cultural usages that I was familiar with. I felt very close to, you know, like Jason and the Golden Fleece or all of the mythologies around uh, gold. Mm -hmm. It's quite, quite a, there are quite a few, you know? 
And it's not, that is one thing that's not arbitrary. In a funny way, I would say using gold as the basis for a financial system, for example, or for an idea of value, that's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. But I think that Jason Gold and the Golden Fleece actually come from the fact of what gold is. But unfortunately, that experience has been denied most people. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, this is that experience. Right, right. And, but it's also, there's, there's more poetry in that. And I guess, you know, I'm thinking, for example, let's like think about how Rauschenberg used gold, right? To kind of question the hierarchy of material. So we take gold and he in a box and he puts it next to tissue paper in a box right to like question that value mm -hmm. and what you're doing so differently is is imbuing this kind of conceptual question with so much so much poetry and, and beauty and to go back to the landscape i i think we can't keep talking about this work without bringing up a really important piece of writing that's really come to define it and and I'm getting questions already about it. So, uh, you know, at, at, when this piece was shown in 1990 at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, um, the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres encountered it with his, his partner, Ross. And he also had this discovery, right? This discovery that you had that I'm watching our visitors have and I'm gonna read it because I think it's that important to how this is defined the significance of the work. Um, he said, we were blown away by the heroic, gentle and horizontal presence of this gift. There was in a white room all by itself. It didn't need company, it didn't need anything. Sitting on the floor ever so lightly, a new landscape, a possible horizon, a place of rest and absolute beauty, waiting for the right viewer, willing and needing to be moved by a place of the imagination. And it is such an extraordinary piece of writing. I can go on and on to our viewers. You can get it online quite easily. Um, and he goes on to say that whenever he and his, his, his partner would subsequently see a sunset, they would call it a gold field. And this is all too for the artists against the backdrop of what was happening in the 90s. This was also a really difficult time, socially, politically, uh, and personally for the artists, because at the time, as, as Felix Gonzalez said, his partner was dying in front of him of AIDS. And I, I just wanna say like that has really kind of come to define how this work has evolved in the art historical imagination. And, Ronnie, we have this great question coming in right now. Uh, and he wants to know, um, you know, against the sort of political backdrop of the AIDS pandemic that Felix Gonzalez Torres was talking about how he started initiating uh, this, this dialogue and how Felix Gonzalez Torres was essentially looking at Goldfield and saying like, this is what's giving me hope. There's hope in this work. Um, how you might kind of reflect on on how this might operate now to the audience or how you're understanding it um, in this kind of idea of kind of reinscribing this history um, through the work. I'm not sure I have much to, much to contribute there, but I, I think that um, in my Talking with Felix, I, what I found fascinating was that I, I never met Ross. Okay. And he had passed away a little bit before meeting uh, when I met uh, Felix. And he would always talk about the gold field and Ross. And I thought it was an interesting triangulation between me, Ross, and Felix. Especially, of course, I knew at that time Felix was, was ill. He was doing well, but I knew he was ill. And there was just so, so much content in everything about this gold field and the incredibly 
difficult, uh, both emotionally and physically and politically. Politically, it was a nightmare for uh, gay, gay people, particularly if, if they did contract the disease. It was very, very, very harsh. Uh, the, uh, the hostility and the mentality of the population, general population was, was really difficult to accept. Um, uh, and, and Felix was, he was actively dealing with that um, in his writings and in his work, obviously. But the gold field was sort of common ground for us, you know, and it, it, uh, it both acknowledged and it, it reflected another possibility. Mm -hmm. Ronnie, and of course, like, can, can you talk about the work that kind of came out of this conversation? Oh, this work, yeah. Uh, and this, this is a, a, a paired gold mats for Ross and Felix. And I, what year did I do this? 95 or something, 94, 95. Uh, Felix, I, I may have this all muddied up, but Felix had made a work uh, which, he, which he dedicated to me. It was called uh, Untitled Placebo for Ronnie. Mm -hmm. it, it was a gold field of candies, yeah. gold candies, right? And this is a really beautiful landscape kind of thing. I mean, it can also, I think, I'm not sure it can be shown in a mass, but it was really, kind of, every time I saw it, it was laid out in a field. And, uh, you know, I was deeply moved by that gesture and it inspired this gesture. It inspired the paired gold mats, meaning uh, why not take a second mat and instead of making a fold, which in a way is kind of a demonstration, why not just throw two mats on the floor and let them kind of interact? And uh, that's, you know, when Felix at some point, he was quite ill, at this point, but I sent him a photograph of it. And he talked about the sweat in between the two mats. And I thought that was pretty beautiful. So it's an idea of intimacy. It, it really was important to me to do this work. Uh, it is so, I mean, the, just thinking about the, the trend, you know, the gold field to the gold mats paired, how the, the, metaphor is extended and how sort of the gesture of these two fields coming together invokes this such a beautiful idea of intimacy and 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 sweat as he said and you can certainly feel that and how the light comes through uh, especially in this image which is absolutely extraordinary um uh ronnie we have a another question this you know, pertains to the idea of sculpture and how this work, I think, has operated in art history. Um, you know, in 1979, like right before um, you make this work, uh, Rosalind Krauss publishes her, her, you know, landmark essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field. Um, and this question comes to us from Alison Green at the MFA H. And she's wondering if uh, you at all kind of were thinking about this sort of concept of sculpture as you were making this work? Um, I kind of doubt it because what I stopped reading art historical material mm -hmm. and criticism uh, when I was in graduate school. I, I became very, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, I lost my connection to seeing things that way. And then I uh, decided that it was, I, I, I only wanted to spend time reading primary source materials like fict authors and journalists and this sort of thing. Yeah. And I stopped reading art history, period. I, I wanted, because I felt like it was cutting me off from the empirical possibilities in the experience, mm -hmm. having, you know, uh, and I and I actually found when I was at Yale, I, I took a course with uh, 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 it, Ra, uh, I'm going to forget his name. Uh, very famous art historian who 
was talking about Impressionism. And he would project these images of, I don't know, let's say a Matisse or a Van Gogh. And it would be a detail. You'd see this brush stroke, you know, 12 feet high. And I just, I couldn't relate to this way of looking at things or talking about things. And I felt quite alienated, to be honest. So I, I'm not gonna plead ignorance for uh, definitely not, but I wouldn't say that that was a source of influence or at least consciously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, so, you know, talking about Felix Gonzalez, uh, Torres's interpretation and reflection were, talking about the AIDS pandemic, we're talking about the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this piece was made 40 years ago now. How, how, how has your understanding of the work changed or evolved over this time? Well, you know what happens when, you, when I finish a work, I walk away. Uh, I kind of, I, I can't say that my perception of it has evolved that much. I think it's it's doing the job I wanted it to do. And of course that has a, a range of meanings given the new context of history that mm -hmm. keeps bringing to it. Uh, but the actual, there's something quite incontrovertible about the object. It's, you know, in terms of the way I approached it, it's kind of an absolute thing and it's not really negotiable. You know what I'm saying? It, it kind of sticks to itself pretty, pretty much, I think. Mm -hmm. Keeping this in a way very non abstract thing because uh, there's nothing, I mean, it is what it is physically, there's nothing abstract about that. You know, obviously in the light of depicted, depictive, type forms or, or um, uh, descriptive things, uh, it, it's not that. It's, 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 a, it's another kind of realism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 um, it's the realism of a, like uh, standing in a landscape. It's that, you, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to represent anything. It's not trying to be anything other than itself. Mm -hmm. And yet that self is uh, a physical reality that's not really, that's incontrovertible. So you know what I'm saying? It's, I see it as another form of realism, not mm -hmm. abstraction, for example. That's with much of my work. Right, right. I mean, and that's why I think this work is so important because it embodies or conceptually what your work is about, period. And, but let's like maybe pivot to that and instead of like how you're, 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 how you're thinking about the work has evolved. What about how you see this work within, within your career as an artist? Like how you, you understand its place uh, within your, your body of work? Well, it was, it was kind of a, the end of a period in a certain way, in the beginning of a period. Uh, what those two sides are, I'm not so sure I know, but it was, it was something, it, it was, a, to have the experience of this work was a really uh, profound thing for me at the time. And, you know, I never showed this work, I, I didn't show it for 10 years, not, not by choice, but it just, the right opportunity never came along. So when I had the opportunity to show it at MoCA, that was really the first time it was sh it shared. I sh was able to share it with a, with the public, um, and I think that had a layer of meaning for me that fascinated me as well. Because on my own, I can look at it and know what the physical reality is of what I'm looking at, but not too many other people can. Because you, you know. <laughs> What what people bring to it is more the the abstraction of gold, you know the the value of gold. Uh, that I think value is the is the big Kahuna here because it it mediates the whole experience, mm -hmm. you know, and that makes gives it a sensationalism. It's not a sensationalism that I cooked up or manipulated. It was inherent in the experience, mm -hmm. you know. 
yeah, but it, it makes it work so well because it gives that tension of like the person saying like, oh, how much is it worth? Like it like states its emphatic kind of empirical truth because you know that it, 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 it the value might be applied, but it's still inherent in when you're approaching that material. But let's, so Ronnie, I wanna, I wanna pivot a little bit to yeah. Island Zombie. Well, that's a good pivot. <laughs> Since we're talking about being present. So uh, uh, this is uh, Ronnie Horn's new book. It came out like in the middle of all of this, if you can believe it, published by uh, Princeton University Press. Um, and it's a compilation, I'm gonna pull the image up on the screen, a compilation of your writings uh, beginning in the, the early 80s. Um, Is it like, the early 80s? What uh, happened there? I can't, I can't tell. I don't, I don't think so. Really? I can't. I can't just. I think it's more like the early 90s. Okay. Uh, I think someone will jump in here on the chat box to tell us when they start. I'm sorry. But I, so as we're installing this piece, I am like digging in deep to your writings. We even started an island zombie book club here in the Manel Collection where we were reading through your work and talking about it. But I just want to say like, as I'm reading it, like, okay, first as a curator and art historian to have an artist like sort of write so beautifully about their work is uh, such a treat, but it, it provided me a way of understanding Goldfield in such an extraordinary way. And I'll say that because what you were just saying about how Goldfield sort of states its presence. And as an extension, as the viewer, you're kind of sorting through your own kind of inclination as a viewer to interpret or apply metaphor to it. Um, and I feel like this entire body of writing is really about you being in Iceland and trying to be present and trying to kind of strip ways of seeing and ways of seeing when, I, like. My favorite moment in the book is you're camping, you're in this like stunningly beautiful place and you are essentially talking about trying to get El Greco out of your head. Um, and I yeah. think that is such an incredible moment like because that's that sort of art historical reference. Like how do I see this uh, without kind of art history seeping into my brain? And I feel like that struggle is essentially what Goldfield is. And I, I, that's not really a question. I just want to say how oh, fantastic yeah. I mean, it is. And you just, you do, you, 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 you as much, you know, when I went, th that was a, a text that was based on an experience uh, when I went there for six months uh, on a dirt bike with, um, uh, with a tent, you know, so now I was out in the, in the weather. And that experience, I didn't even bring any books. I didn't want the distraction. Mind you, you get all these rainy days and you're sitting there. I mean, rain, we're talking real rain. It's like, okay, no books. Boy, that, that was really stupid, <laughs> let me tell you. You know what I mean? But it, it was the idea that, you know, I, I would engage with the moment for six months, which was like, I don't know, uh, kind of uh, idealism. Mm -hmm. uh, or delusion or something but um so that's that was a commentary on no matter how you you try to to empty out the system to just be there and let what's there be there you are one is always bringing in things from other parts of the world to make sense and to give oneself a connection to things. Mm -hmm. And and I just, I, this, all of these, which are short texts, essentially, it's it's about that struggle to see and be present. And I think the struggles at the heart of, of Goldfield and, you know, what you say, you know, to see, a, how do you see a landscape as it is, which is something you've said quite a bit. 
And then I also love the part where you're, you're looking up at the sky and you're looking at the clouds and you're trying not to associate the forms of the clouds to something in the world. And then you sort of make this declarative statement that a cloud can only take the shape of itself. And that is the line that like allowed me to see Goldfield and yeah, a, a different- That's a really good connection. You know, you're the first person, and I guess because I haven't really assembled my writings formally before, but you're the first person that's commented on that. And I, I, I totally get it. I mean, I know there is a profound connection, but it's not one I'm really seeing for myself. Uh -huh. because the writings are sort of like the gold piece. There's not really a big distinction for me. You know, the, the, my relationship is, is one of pathology and necessity. So, uh, and so it's sort of all coming from the same source. But can I ask you about that with your writings? Do you use the writings as a source for thinking about new works? Does it become a place to go to sometimes you're... sometimes I, I i find myself uh for example when i did the work for two uh, piece for two rooms also things that happen again mm -hmm. things that happen again is a, a paired object that can be installed in four different ways and each each one is a different is a different identity so it's one object with let's say for example four identities that was that work that work came to me when I was sitting uh, uh, outside reading a, a book, and there was a, there was actually a, a problem. They, they, there was a mistake in the binding, so that uh, the same uh, page appeared in two different places. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, obviously the second is not the same as the first, even though the words are identical, because what came before and what went after is different, right? And that idea of something being identical is really, uh, it, it's, uh, it's an impossibility mm -hmm. because context alters access and identity. Mm -hmm. So when I did the piece for two rooms, you had the one object that you went in and there it was and boom, and you walk into the next room and it turns out the same thing, except you already experienced one. So that first time you can't have it again. So now you've got this effectively a repeat, mm -hmm. but it's not a repeat because it's, cu uh, it's cumulative. You mm -hmm. see, so you have this chronology that's accumulating. It's not, um, the, the beauty of a pair is that you've got the space between, and that is the same space that you and I exist in. Mm -hmm. And that your work makes an argument for. Well, or it just exists and it just takes advantage of that fact. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of going back to that understanding of the experience and, and your writing, do you use writing to understand that experience and the thing with writing is you you and you cannot get to certain things any other way mm -hmm. and what what happens in writing for me is almost always a discovery uh for me i'm not saying it's the light bulb moment necessarily but it gives me a whole different kind of understanding of what i do anywhere else in my life Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's directly related and it does have its influence, but it's not like a, it's not self, it's not, not obvious, let's say. I mean, are you always writing? Is that just part of your practice or? Well, no, I, th I think language is a huge part of my, my consciousness. It's just uh, like that weird title I came up with for the Empire State Building photographs in Log. Uh, I'm not going to remember it. Uh, an empire a day. Uh, what is it? An empire a day makes illusion. Um, what is it? Ronnie, I, you, this is a new title Ronnie just told me about right before we turned on the screen for everyone. Well, Ronnie, do you want to, since, since we're talking about the Empire State Building, it relates to your new body of work that's been up at Hauser and Wirth uh, last month. Um, 
You want to put a visual up or? Yeah, let's you know, let me let me throw it on the screen here. Um, uh, so this is your your new work, something you've been working on. Gosh, I mean, the Manila collections in there when we were installing, which was exciting. So you started spring of 2019, and you've been doing essentially entries every day. Um, yeah, is that is that correct? Uh, and it's an extraordinary group of diaristic. It's text. It you are, are. What I love too is that you're kind of going back to older work and reflecting on it in a way. Um, and it's approximately 430 works. It's you know you don't have to exaggerate, Michelle. It's 406. <laughs> We're so close. 406. New. Okay. And in this series, there are 24 images of the Empire State Building uh, that were taken from my, my uh, apartment over the period of time um, and at various intervals. And what I found really striking about the Empire State Building, and for me quite unexpected, is how much subtlety and range of uh, uh, visual presence it had. Uh, so I persisted. And actually the title of that series is An Empire a Day Keeps Illusion Away. <laughs> okay, so that's that was that. Um, unfortunately, there are no images from I that know, particular light motif here. But, but Ronnie, I mean, we were gonna give a teaser too because so Log will be published by Z Books um, and will be released in the early fall, I think uh, early September. Um, so there's a lot more to keep talking about. Um, and um, I did find out today that it has been released as an online exhibition. Uh, so you can all see it. I went through it today and it was such a pleasure. Um, I, I think it's really intimate. It's it's personal. It's and it's also much like I think the writings in Island Zombie, such a sort of way of understanding your how you approach your works, how you approach your sculpture, your works on paper, um, and your, your understanding of, of your your practice. Um, Ronnie, um, I think we have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, yeah, that I, actually goes back to what, oh, okay. what, here. I was, yeah, I was thinking it would be interesting perhaps for people to see the overall installation. Oh, yes. There yeah. we go. Yeah, so you see the scale and the relationship to the reader viewer. And it's it's completely engrossing. So and it's all hand handwritten, a lot of handwritten text. It's a a compilation. Um, so stay posted for that. We will certainly carry it in the Manila Collection uh, bookstore. Um, but I, I kind of want to keep talking about Island Zombie. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to that. Got there um, because also what. I thought a lot about as I was reading a bit as, as our Island Zombie book club is how much your experience in Iceland, you're not only grappling with how to see a landscape, how to see a cloud as itself, you're also dealing with isolation. And at, at one point you're kind of, you're talking about like how making being here is enough while you're also reflecting that boredom is a mirror. And if there was a sort of like mantra for our time of understanding this, uh, how kind of insular we've all become in kind of having this new experience. And um, was there any kind of thoughts as you were thinking about releasing these writings about the, the contemporary moment and how, how this, this might pertain to it now? It's not, it's not clear to me. I definitely think this particular text, Notes on the Obsolescence of Islands, is very much about our time and the loss of 
uh, things through uh, in part overpopulation or globalization, um, you know, islands uh, as a physical entity are pretty much over in the sense that physically and chemically they, they have sort of merged with the mainland, so to speak. And uh, so the experience, for example, of my travels to Iceland um, over the years, part of my attraction was the possibility of getting lost. It was both a fear and uh, uh, something that drew me to it. Uh, witness today, now it's really pretty much impossible to get lost, except maybe briefly in a storm or a traumatic organic event, like a sandstorm or something, but it doesn't last. And you're pretty much always found. Uh, not that I ever want to be found, you know, it's more that idea of, of improvising into the next moment, you know. And that was part of why I, I spent the kind of time I did in Iceland. But and when I was doing it, there was nobody there. So that was an incredible thing to have this relationship to a landscape that was unsullied by human or commercial presence. Uh, and at the same time, it was a type of landscape where you really, you know, it was kind of bewitching in the sense that so much of it, you, you, would, you couldn't tell if it was organic or man-made. It was a very, very, I, I, when I first started going there, it was a shock, <laughs> so. And I'm gonna, I just turned the page, so to speak, of the book, and you have this line that, um, this passage that distance is no longer a measure of separation. And you, you write, when all is accessible, nothing is far away. And in some ways, this whole compilation of writing seems like a type of mourning for something that you're-, well, you, you're This particular text, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely uh, a, a f the feeling the loss. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as we look, you know, obviously with climate change, which is uh, the, the, bad, the very, very, very fine and complex balance of nature and the forces that make the simplest thing happen, you know, and, and watching those threads break, really, uh, it's quite radical. You know, what you can't see is definitely coming to get us, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah, there's that that also that poignant moment in log where you talk about the the death of a glacier that's been important to you in Iceland this past year. Well, actually, that was more uh, that was in the news obituary for a glacier. Uh, that was Iceland uh, discovering its uh, vulnerability that way. One glacier did disappear. Uh, last year, I think it was last year. It was a very small glacier, but nevertheless, it's it's a shock to lose something you grew up with. I mean, it was always there and it always appeared to be more or less the same, you know? Uh -huh. and, and then, uh, and of course nothing is the same, but, but, you know, especially when you're a kid, you think, you know, the same, everything looks the same every day, you know? And as you get older, I guess you, you become, I don't know if you become more discerning, but you just know the reality is, is not what it appears to be, you know? Mm -hmm. But the idea of losing a large mass that was highly visible in the landscape is disturbing and unsettling in a way that very few things are. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and I, I think it would, it, within your writings, within, let's go back to Bold Fields, um, there is still though, such hope and belief in hope that I think like what Felix Gonzalez Torres said about your work in finding this, this moment. And you end, you end the book, like your very last paragraph, which is so beautiful that you're essentially saying the existence of the unseen, the unex unaccessible places are of profound consequence and that they are what function to keep the world, you write, large and hopeful and unknown. And it's such a 
sort of beautiful way to end in this book because that's precisely what Goldfield does. Wow, that's a beautiful uh, connection, Michelle. You know, when I wrote that text, uh, I wrote it to uh, when I was working, I was contributing articles to the uh, daily newspaper in Iceland and I did something once a week for about a year or so or something like that. And uh, that particular one, which was never published, was written uh, about the uh, problem or the, my concern with the building of a dam in an area in Iceland, which was exceptionally beautiful, but highly inaccessible. So what it amounted to, when I would talk to people in Iceland about it, I often heard them say, well, I'm not ever gonna go there, so it doesn't really matter. And I was so shocked by that, that I, I wrote this text. You know? Um, and you're the paper, you mentioned that's what's on the cover of the book, right? That we're looking at. That that actually is one of one edition of Iceland's difference. It's kind of a visual editorial. So what you're what you're looking at is photograph I took back in the late 80s mm -hmm. uh, of of a swimming pool that, as you can see, is situated uh, really nestled very very much into the shoreline and the uh, tide being out. But when the tide comes in, that little that little uh, swimming pool is is like a little peninsula into the ocean there. And uh, what I write about is the experience of uh, privacy in a public place, which is what happens when you get into hot water in a completely open, unbounded space. I mean, there's so much. We haven't even talked about water when. Well, Ronnie, we're out of time. Yeah, isn't that the story? Like we can, let's just like say we're gonna keep this conversation going in the fall. Absolutely. You talk know, about I, your new book. I enjoy um, that. Yeah. Well, I, I hope to see you in real life soon. Yeah, nice. Um, thank you very much, Michelle. No, oh, thank you. Um, Ronnie, we'll say goodbye and I'll just uh, thank everyone for joining us. We do have copies of Island Zombie available at our bookstore. Um, and uh, please join us. Our next uh, artist talk program is with the artist Alice Acock uh, in association with the exhibition Dream Monuments. And that talk will be June 16th. And as always, additional information about programs can be found on our website, and we will be posting this conversation uh, in about a week. So thank you all. Thank you, Ronnie. See you soon. Take care, Michelle. Pleasure. <laughs>